And let's have our Google Classroom. Let's see, that's not what I want. This is what I want. There we go. And then this one. All right, so before we get started, just a quick reminder. Uh, most people have gotten the midterm turned in already, so thank you very much for that. I've almost finished grading all of the midterms that have been turned in. I only have a few more, so hopefully if you don't know your midterm grade already, you should soon. If you haven't gotten it turned in yet, please, please get it turned in as soon as possible. The midterm is a big chunk of your grade. It's worth 23 points, whereas most of your homeworks are between like 5, 10, 15 points, somewhere around there. So it does make up a big chunk of your grade, and it's definitely not something that you want to forget about before the end of the term. So please, if you haven't gotten it turned in already, please go back and finish it up and get it turned in. All right, so we are here in week five of Excel Center, week five of IPC, which means that we are four weeks down and four to go. We have officially passed the halfway point of this term. So that, of course, means that before you know it, we are going to finish up with the school year. So for the most part, a lot of you guys have done a great job of keeping up with all of your homework, all of your attendance checks, all your daily assignments. So keep up the good work for just a few more weeks, and then we will be all finished up with the term. So like I said, today we're going to be talking about chemical reactions, how these different matters, different substances come together and combine together in different ways to produce this new material, these new substances that weren't here before. Hey, Amber, good to see you. Thanks for being here, I appreciate it. So we've already talked a little bit about this in terms of the chemical change, changes in a material that causes it to turn into something different and chemical bonds. So we've talked about the physical process of atoms sharing or taking those electrons and forming bonds with other atoms. And so today we're going to kind of put both of those ideas together in chemical reactions. All right, so Chemical reactions are all about changing substances. So we call something a chemical reaction when it goes through a chemical change. When we start off with one set of substances and it changes into something new, something different from what we started with. So there are a whole bunch of chemical reactions going on around you every day that you may not realize. Stuff like eating and growth. So all of the energy that your body gets, it gets it from the food that you ingest. And so it takes one substance, that being the fruits and vegetables and meat and grains that you're eating, and it turns that into different substances, proteins and cells and energy that your body needs. And it does that through a whole bunch of chemical reactions, chemical changes inside your cells that essentially allows us to unlock the energy stored in food. Ripening is another kind of everyday chemical reaction. So if you've ever seen tomatoes like growing on vines, you'll see that they start off as this sort of bright green color, but then slowly as they become more and more ripe, they turn into that beautiful red color that we associate with them with. Same thing with something like a banana. A banana, right, if you buy like a very fresh banana at the store, it's like all green to start with, right? And then over time, it changes and becomes yellow. And then eventually it gets 
really brown and mushy and kind of gross. That all happens because of ripening, a chemical reaction happening inside the, the skin and fruit of the banana or of the tomato that changes some of the starch molecules into sugar molecules. So it starts off as a very kind of dense, starchy, grassy type of material. Like if you ever eaten a super unripe banana, a super green banana, it's almost kind of crunchy, it's very starchy, but over time, due to things that the banana produces or gives off, that changes into more sugar type compounds. So it becomes sweeter, it becomes a little bit squishier, a little bit tastier. And then if you let it go too long, it'll start to become overripe, it becomes super squishy, very mushy, uh, it kind of tastes funky if you try to eat it when it's all brown and nasty. But that change, so that change in the visuals and the texture and everything, that is a chemical reaction. It's a slow chemical reaction happening over time inside of the banana or inside of the tomato. Decomposing is basically like the opposite of growing. And so decomposers like mold and fungi and bacteria and stuff use dead material, dead animals and plants and break down that dead matter and convert it into their own energy. They convert it into their own forms of food. So they're taking this dead material and they're turning it into something else, some new substance that they can use for food or for their cells. And then one that we've talked about a little bit when we talked about chemical changes, burning, AKA combustion. So taking something and heating it up, lighting it on fire, and then it changes into something new, like how this wood here will eventually turn into smoke that goes up into the sky and ash that's left over at the bottom of the fire pit. And the smoke and the ash are new. They're different from the wood that we started with. So burning wood or burning propane or gasoline or anything like that, that is a chemical reaction. It's a reaction between the wood and the gasoline and the oxygen and the air reacting in this super hot, bright way that we call fire or burning. So when a chemical reaction is going on, when substances are interacting and creating something new, there's usually some way for us to tell. There's about six different signs that you could have a chemical reaction going on. Some chemical reactions might only produce one of these, some might produce a whole lot, but there's usually some sort of indication, some sort of signal that a chemical reaction is happening. One of them that we went over when we talked about chemical changes the other week was bubbles appearing. So bubbles appear when a new gas has been created in our substances. So like when you drop the Alka-Seltzer in the water and it starts fizzing and bubbling and all this new stuff is coming up, or when you mix the vinegar and the baking soda and you get the big lava volcano explosion of stuff, that all happens because of the bubbles appearing because all of a sudden you're creating all of this new gas that's trying to go up and out and escape from the water or the vinegar or whatever it is that it's been mixed in. So new bubbles showing up when you mix things together could be a sign that a chemical reaction is going on. You could also have the opposite occur. You could end up with, instead of a new gas appearing as bubbles, you could end up with a new solid appearing. So because it's science, we always have to give things fancy names. And so a new solid formed from a chemical reaction is called a precipitate. And so this would be like if you mix two different liquids together, two different liquid chemicals together, and all of a sudden, like a powder or like a mineral starts to form on the bottom of your test tube or your beaker or whatever you're mixing stuff in. 
that would be a sign that a chemical reaction has happened. You've created this new solid that was not there before. And remember, chemical reactions, all about creating new things. You could have a color change that occurs. Uh, so this would be something like when we were talking earlier about the tomato or the banana, right? A tomato, as it ripens, changes from green to red. A banana, as it ripens, goes from green to yellow to brown. So those colors are changing because the chemicals inside the skin and inside the fruit are changing as well. And as they change, it causes them to change colors. Now, what this does not count as is it does not count if you're making purple Kool-Aid and so you take the purple Kool-Aid mixture and you dump it into the water and you stir the water around and then the water turns purple. That's not the type of chemical change or the color change that we're talking about. That's just you mix two things together and it took on the color of the powder. This is more like if you, like if you've ever seen at like a pool or something where the guy takes like the little scoop of water in the tubes and then has like the clear liquid that he drops in and one of them turns kind of yellow and one of them turns kind of purple and it tells them about like, at pH and chlorine amount or something like that. Those are the kinds of color changes that I'm talking about. So like you have two clear liquids, but they produce the color yellow or they produce the color purple. Taking a purple powder and mixing it into clear water and it turns purple, that is not a chemical reaction. Because you're not really making anything new. You're just making the little purple sugar crystals all spread throughout the water. So other types of signs of chemical reaction is a temperature change. So you could heat up or cool down while the chemical reaction is going on. Obviously fire is a great example of this. Fire gives off a lot of heat and fire is a chemical reaction between the wood and the air. Um, another one that is less common around here since we don't really get that cold in the winter time besides that freak snowstorm in February but when I lived in Ohio, I made use of the little hand warmers, which if you've never seen them before, there are these little packets. They look kind of like the silica stuff that you get in your shoes when you buy new shoes and the stuff that says like, don't eat because it's for moisture absorption or something like that. They look kind of like that. And they sit there most of the time not doing anything. But when you're about to go outside and it's like nine degrees outside, you take one of those little packets, squish it up, and put it inside your glove or put it down your boot. And after a couple of minutes, it starts to get really, really warm and starts to heat up that area. And it keeps your fingers and toes nice and toasty. The reason why it does that is there's two chemicals in that little packet that are separated. But when you squish it and mix it together, those chemicals interact, go through a chemical reaction, and they start to heat up. That's just a natural part of their chemical reaction. They give off a lot of heat. And so as they're giving off heat, you use that to keep your fingers and toes from freezing when it's ridiculously cold and snowy and icy outside. So lots of chemical reactions will give off a lot of heat. Some chemical reactions actually decrease the heat. They'll absorb the heat from the chemicals. Light is another common re byproduct of chemical reactions happening. So obviously something like combustion reactions, like fire or burning things. Fire not only produces heat, but it also produces a lot of light, right? The, it'll light up the night when you get a big bonfire going. Another good example of this in nature is fireflies. So those little bugs that fly around and have the green glow coming out of their butt that is because of a chemical reaction there's a special protein inside of their abdomens and when that protein is broken it releases this energy and some of that energy is light 
energy. And so it actually produces light as part of that protein getting broken. And then finally, you could, if you're not just looking at a chemical reaction, but also smelling or tasting it, changing how something smells or how something tastes could also be a sign of a chemical reaction. Think about that banana example from earlier, right? If you bite it when it's really green, it's kind of chewy and starchy. And then if you wait till it ripens a little bit, it converts some of that to sugar. And so when it's yellow and you eat it, it's nice and sweet and it's a little bit chewy, but a little bit mushy. It's a really nice texture. Uh, my one-year-old really loves bananas in the morning because she can like break them apart with her hands and eat them all on her own. And she's all about that. But if you let it go for too long and it gets really brown, all of a sudden now it's really mushy. It smells kind of funky. If you eat it accidentally, it has like that super gross, sticky, sweet flavor that's kind of nasty. And it's all due to converting all that, all of those starch molecules into sugar molecules. So the banana kind of starts to break down because it doesn't have that structure anymore. And that's all because of that chemical reaction of ripening. So obviously cooking and baking has a lot of chemical reactions going on in it. Uh, one of the most famous ones is called the Maillard reaction. And it's the reason why your burgers and your steaks on the grill get that nice char on the outside. When the proteins and the meat hit that really hot skillet or that really hot grill, they go through a reaction, which is what turns them that brown, black, charred kind of color and gives them a little bit different flavor than the rest of the meat that's not charred. So all of these things are the result of something new being produced by our chemical reaction. We produced a new gas, we produced a new solid, we produced a chemical that has a different color than the ones that we started with. We released some heat energy or we absorbed some heat energy. We produced some light, we changed chemicals and how they smelled and tasted. All of these are signs that chemical reactions could be happening, that we're creating these new materials. So here you can see some bubbles that are forming as a result of the chemical reaction in this glass right here. Down here, we have another example of what's called bioluminescence, which is just a fancy word of saying light made by animals and plants. So I talked about the firefly earlier, Jellyfish can also do this. They also have a very similar process by which they break proteins and release light as a byproduct. So all of these can indicate that a chemical reaction is happening. So if you see one or if you smell or taste one, that could mean that you're seeing some sort of change in your material, in your chemicals. So when we are dealing with chemical reactions, we have our starting material, our stuff that we are starting with that's going to come together to do the reaction. And then we have our ending material, the stuff that we end up making, the new material that we're creating in the chemical reaction. So the substances that combine, the substances that are going to react together, scientists decided to give them the extremely creative and unique name of reactants. So the reactants are the substances that react together. So they are the first part of our chemical reaction. So a lot of times you'll see chemical reactions written as this. We have your starting materials on the left-hand side and then an arrow, meaning that we're making and we're producing our new materials, our ending materials on the right-hand side. So you can kind of think of it as like similar to a math equation where the arrow sign represents like the equal sign. So we mix our starting chemicals together in some way and we end up making our ending chemicals. 
again, scientists looked at these ending chemicals, said, well, these are the things that are produced at the end of the chemical reaction. So we should give them a really clever name, something like products. So our products are the substances that are produced at the end of the chemical reaction. They are the new substances that we are making at the end of our chemical reaction. So we start off with the reactants. The reactants are gonna come together and mix and combine, maybe change around some of their chemical bonds, form some new ionic bonds, form some new covalent bonds. And eventually we will make some products or sometimes very, very quickly, we'll make some products, some ending materials, some final things that are produced at the end of our chemical reaction. So we start with the reactants that react together, and then we make the products, the things that are produced at the end of the chemical reaction. The reactants will always be on the left-hand side, the beginning part of the arrow, and the products will always be on the right-hand side, on the ending part of the arrow. All right, so that's sort of the basics of what's going on in a chemical reaction. Does anybody have any questions, anything that is sort of unclear that you're still a little bit confused about with chemical reactions so far. No. All right. I had a really good question in my earlier IPC class about will chemical reactions just happen forever? Is there ever any stopping point? And the simple answer is yes, there is a stopping point, and that is when we run out of reactants. If we no longer have enough reactants to do the reaction, if there's no longer different materials to come together, then the chemical reaction will stop. So like if we take our log from earlier, for example, once the log is all burned up and it's all turned to smoke and ash, then there's no more fire, right? The fire, go, the fire dies, it goes out because there's no more wood to burn. We've run out of reactants. There's no more wood that we can work through and keep that fire going. So most chemical reactions will come to an end at some point. And in most cases, it's usually due to running out of reactants, no longer being able to have those starting materials to get the chemical reaction going or to keep it going. All right, so I've talked about chemical reactions in kind of very general terms, but I wanted to show you guys a specific chemical reaction to kind of point out some of the major concepts that are really important to understand about how these reactants and products are related to each other. So the chemical reaction that I'm gonna show you, the equation for a chemical reaction I'm gonna show you is one for a process called photosynthesis. So without me showing it to you, does anybody know kind of in general, what is photosynthesis or what does photosynthesis do? Photosynthesis is where the plant creates its food from the sunlight. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So photosynthesis is how plants make energy. It is the reason why they're able to sit in the sun and grow and make their energy. Whereas you and I cannot do photosynthesis. I don't care how long you go and stand in the parking lot. If you don't eat anything, you're going to be hungry by the end of the day. Plants don't have that problem. They can make their own food by being in the sun and the process by which they make their food is called photosynthesis. So I'm going to show you the equation. It's going to look big and confusing. Don't worry about too much about the actual equation. You won't have to like remember the photosynthesis equation for any sort of exam or anything. I just want to use it to show you a couple important pieces about 
chemical reactions. So here is our photosynthesis equation. We have our carbon dioxide over here, CO2. So that's one of the compounds that we talked about the other week. Water is another big compound, H2O. Again, two different atoms that are bonded together. And so we're gonna take carbon dioxide and water, our starting materials, and using the energy from the sun, we're gonna turn that into glucose, which is this big molecule right here that's made out of six carbons and 12 hydrogens and six oxygens. Glucose is a type of sugar. It's like the basic type of sugar that plants make in photosynthesis. So if you ever see a structure of it, it looks kind of cool. It's like this ring of six carbons that makes the sh sugar glucose. And then also we have a byproduct of oxygen. So the main thing that they're trying to make is glucose. This is what the plants want. And then they make some oxygen as part of the reaction as well. So again, we're starting off with carbon dioxide and water and we're making glucose and oxygen. So remind me again, what is it, what are these guys over here called? What are our starting materials in our chemical reaction called? We just talked about it. It starts with an R. Uh, the reactants? Hey, there you go. Exactly. These guys are our reactants. So carbon dioxide and water are what are going to be combining together. These are what are going to be reacting together inside of the plant. And so the plant is making these guys. It's making these glucose and oxygen molecules over here. So what are these guys called? What do we end up with in a chemical reaction? Product. Bingo. The products. Products are what we are making. So like I said, it looks kind of like a math equation, right? We have our reactants over on the left-hand side that are combining together. And then we're making the products. We're making glucose and oxygen. These are the final results of photosynthesis. This is what is being produced by having carbon dioxide and water react together. So the first important thing to notice that's something you probably already did notice is that obviously these guys and these guys are not the same, right? Our reactants and our products are different substances, different materials. That is what makes it a chemical reaction. Because remember, chemical reactions are all about creating new substances, new combinations of atoms that were not there before. And these guys, we definitely did not have any glucose or oxygen to start off with. We made these by combining these guys together in a different way. So we start off with one set of substances. We end up with something new, something different that was not there before. That is the definition of a chemical reaction. That is what is going on here. So that's kind of the first big thing to point, I wanted to point out about chemical reactions is that they're all about creating something new. Our starting materials and our ending materials are different. They're not the same thing. The second thing, a little bit more technical that I wanted to point out is that in chemical reactions, we cannot create or destroy any new atoms. We can only rearrange the atoms we're given. And what I mean by that is that we can't add in any atoms over here that are not over here. 
So for example, sure, we have carbon dioxide and water as our starting materials. But if we look at the atoms that actually build them up, we have some carbons, we have some oxygens right here and right here, and we have some hydrogens right here. So there's three different atoms that make up carbon dioxide and water. There's carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. If we look over here on the product side, we have some oxygen, just like we did on the reactant side. We have some hydrogen, just like we did on the reactant side. And we have some carbon, just like we did on the reactant side. So we have the same sets of atoms on either side. There's carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen over here, and carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen over here. We have just rearranged how they're attached to one another. We've rearranged the way that they bond together. So we've broken up some of these bonds over here and added new ones in and taken away some. But we haven't in, added in any new atoms, right? There's no like nitrogen or no sulfur or no iron that just happened to show up over on the product side. And also we did not take away any atoms, right? There's three different atoms over here on the reactants. And there's three different atoms over here on the products. So we cannot create or destroy any of our atoms. We can only rearrange them. So before we had carbon and oxygen and hydrogen and oxygen that were bonded together. But then we mixed that up. We switched it around a bit. So now we have lots of carbons and hydrogens and oxygens all bonded together. And then some leftover oxygen that's just kind of off on its own. So again, same types of atoms on either side, we have just rearranged them. We've attached them together in different ways in order to create new substances, new materials. But it's still made out of the same atoms. It's still the same building blocks. It's kind of like if you and your friend were both given the exact same set of like Legos or something like that. And he built a castle and you built a rocket ship or something. You start off with the same box of Legos, the same set of building blocks, but you changed it into something different from each other. Same thing is going on here. We have to use all of these building blocks in our final products. We can't add in anything extra and we can't leave anything out. We can change around how many of them there are. We can alter exactly how many go in each compound, but they have to be the same types of atoms. If we have C's, O's, and H's over on the reactants, we have to have C's, O's, and H's over on the products. What is the sixes for? These guys right here? Yes. These indicate how many of each compound that we need. So for example, in order to make one molecule of glucose, we need six compounds of carbon dioxide. So we need six CO2s and six Waters, six H2O molecules. And if we bring those guys together, we'll be able to make one glucose molecule and six oxygen molecules. So that is a great question. And we're actually going to be talking a whole lot more about these big numbers right here and what they mean in class on Thursday, when we talk about trying to balance our chemical reactions. So good catch though, That's, they just mean how many carbon dioxides and how many waters we need in order to make one glucose and six oxygens. All right, so 
two main things, different compounds, different materials on the reactant side and on the product side, but all of the materials are made from the same atoms. So whatever atoms that we have in the reactant side, we have to use those types of atoms on the product side. We can switch them up, we can move them around, we can rearrange who's attached to who and what goes where, but we have to have the same types of atoms. If we have C's, H's, and O's on the reactants, we have to have C's, H's, and O's in the products. No more and no less. All right. Any other questions related to chemical reactions or our photosynthesis reaction here? Anything that you're still a little confused on, still need a little bit of help understanding? No. All right. So the other thing that we have to talk about when we talk about chemical reactions is energy. So like I was saying earlier, when we talked about the different signs of a chemical reaction, some reactions will release heat and energy. Some reactions will absorb heat and energy, kind of like photosynthesis here. It needed sunlight energy in order to make this work, right? These guys won't just randomly spontaneously make glucose on their own. They need, some sunlight in order to provide the energy for the reaction. And just like the atoms in our chemical reaction, energy also has to be conserved in these reactions. We also can't make or destroy energy as part of this process. We can transform it, we can change the energy from one type to another, but we can't have energy that goes nowhere or that appears out of nowhere. We have to have the same total amount of energy at the beginning of the reaction as at the end of the reaction. So for kind of a simple example here, you can think about a basic light bulb, especially like one of those older light bulbs that gets like really hot if you leave it on for too long. If we have 100 units of electrical energy going in, so 100 electricity going in, the light bulb is going to produce five units of energy to make light and 95 of those units of energy are going to create heat from the coil heating up to produce the light. So we have 100 and 100 at the start and end of our reaction of our light bulb, right? We have 100 to start with and then 5 and 95 makes 100 at the end but it's been changed into different types of energy. So we start off with electrical energy, but we use that to create light energy and heat energy. And this is true for chemical reactions as well. Whatever energy goes into them has to be present in some form at the end of them. So like the photosynthesis example I was saying earlier, that one transforms light energy into chemical energy for the plant. So the sun, as you may be aware, produces a massive amount of energy each second. Some of that energy makes it to earth in the form of light and heat energy. Plants can absorb that light energy and turn it into glucose, which is a source of chemical energy. Glucose is what the plants are gonna use in order to help grow new leaves or grow new roots or grow taller or make fruit and berries and stuff or make flowers later on in the year. And those are all gonna require chemical energy from the plant. And the plant makes that chemical energy in the form of glucose by getting light energy from the sun. Similarly, if we eat that fruit that the plant makes, we're gonna take the chemical energy from the plant and turn it into chemical energy for us as humans. So the energy is not being lost to the environment. It's not being destroyed at any point. It's just 
changing. It's going from one form to another. So in general, when we think about how energy is related to chemical reactions, we can kind of group them into two major groups of reactions that release and give off energy and reactions like photosynthesis that absorb and take in energy. The first type of reaction in energy is called an exothermic reaction. And this is a chemical reaction that releases energy, usually as heat or light, to the environment. So exo is a scientific prefix meaning like release or give out or go out, go outside. And then thermic is like thermal, like heat. So an exothermic reaction, heat that is going out. So the energy is being released into the environment. Usually, almost always, it'll this energy is gonna result in some sort of heat, some sort of increase in temperature. So the outside surroundings absorb that energy, which causes them to heat up in most cases. So things like digesting food, as we break down food in our body, it produces energy and heat. And that is partially what we use to keep our body temperature so high. So as a lot of you are probably familiar now, as you probably had to get your temperature checked a whole bunch of times, thanks to COVID, the human interior body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is usually a lot warmer than the room that you're sitting in. Even this classroom right now is probably like uh, 75 degrees. So 20 degrees cooler than the inside of my body. So humans are constantly producing heat in order to keep our body that warm. And breaking down and digesting food is a great way of releasing that energy and releasing that heat. Decomposition also, because all of those microbes and fungi and bacteria are also breaking down food, releasing energy that they can use for themselves. And then obviously, burning thing, going through combustion, is a major source of an exothermic reaction, a major source of energy. So like when you are driving around in your car, right? You're burning gasoline in order to make the car go, accelerate and get up to speed. So as you're burning the gasoline, some of that energy is going to physically turning the wheel. So we'd call that like mechanical energy. So the pistons go up and down and that turns the crankshaft, which turns the wheels and lets you go. But a lot of that energy is also being released as heat. So that's why even in winter time when it's cold outside, if you go driving around for 15, 20 minutes and then get out of your car and put your hand by like the hood of the car, it'll feel warm, right? It feels hot. And that's because there's a lot of heat that is produced as you burn that fuel. It's a very, very exothermic reaction to burn fuel. Sometimes light is given off as well. So like I was saying, when you burn like a match or you make a fire in a fireplace, that fire produces a lot of light. So part of the exothermic reaction of burning and fire releases light as well. Not all of them give off light, if you think about the example I was talking about earlier of the little hand warmers that are just little chemical hand warmers, those don't give off any light. Those literally will always look like the little silicon bags from new shoes. But they heat up really nicely and that's what allows your hands and feet to stay cold when it's stay warm when it's very, very, very cold outside. So exothermic reactions Heat is going out. Heat is being released. It's going out into the world, out into the environment. So this burning match right here is an excellent exothermic reaction. There's lots of heat and lots of light that are being given off by the fire here at the end. On the flip side of this, we have endothermic reactions, the opposite type of reaction. 
This is where we are absorbing energy from the environment. We're taking energy into our reaction instead of putting it out. So again, we have thermo for thermal, like heat and energy. Endo is a scientific prefix meaning like into or going in. And so endothermic is energy is going in. It's being absorbed by the environment. A lot of times this happens when we are making new big chemical structures. So like glucose that we were looking at earlier, glucose is a big molecule. It's got six carbons and six oxygens and 12 hydrogens all bonded together. And so the plants need some energy in order to build that big glucose molecule out of our little carbon dioxide and our little water. And so they can absorb energy from the sun in order to create that big molecule. Some endothermic reactions absorb light energy like photosynthesis. Some endothermic reactions absorb heat energy in order to get that chemical reaction to go. Sometimes you'll see endothermic reactions that actually cool down their surroundings. They actually get cold as the reaction is going on. That's a little bit rarer. It doesn't always happen. Um, a lot of endo, like if you ever go next to a plant that's doing photosynthesis, the plant isn't going to feel like cold or anything. So sometimes it'll cause the temperature to drop, but not always. But the main thing is just this idea of absorbing energy from the environment, taking in energy in order for the chemical reaction to happen. Like photosynthesis needs sunlight. If there's no sunlight, then we're not going to make that glucose sugar. Photosynthesis is not going to happen unless we can absorb that sun energy. So endothermic reactions, absorbing energy, taking it into the reaction in order to create some new big chemical bond structure. Exothermic reactions, the energy is being released. We're giving off heat to the environment. It's going out and heating up the surrounding area. All right. Any questions about exothermic reactions, endothermic reactions, or anything about chemical reactions in general that you still want to know a little more about or that you're still confused on? No, I'm following. All right. Very cool. Let's see where we at. There we at. All righty. So a couple simple kind of assignments for the next couple days, just to kind of keep this chemical reaction stuff fresh in your brain. So for today's assignment, I just want you to tell me about those signs that a chemical reaction is happening. And so there's a slide all about it that we looked at a little bit earlier. We talked about the different things that you can see or smell or taste when a chemical reaction is going on between two substances. So all I want you to do for this one is list out the six different signs of a chemical reaction. And then make sure to come back and check in again on Wednesday for your Wednesday daily assignment. This is another pretty simple one. I basically just want you to compare and contrast endothermic and exothermic. So what are the characteristics of exothermic reactions? How would you kind of describe them? And then what's different about them from endothermic reactions? What are endothermic reactions? What are their characteristics? And how are they different from exothermic reactions? So a couple quick and easy questions. Um, so make sure you come back and check in on Wednesday to finish off with those guys. All right. Anybody have 
any more questions about the notes from today or the assignments that are up for today or that are going to be going up for Wednesday tomorrow. Yeah, Larissa, go for it. Um, so I completely, I don't know what happened yesterday. I completely forgot about the homework yesterday. If I still turn it in, will I still get credit? I understand I probably won't get the attendance, but will I still get the credit for the paper? Yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for pretty much any assignments in uh, this class, if you don't manage to get it turned in on the day it's due, not a huge deal. Just make sure to go back and get it turned in uh, as soon as you can. There's no like late penalty or no late grades. Um, I take everything and give you the full point amount that you earned. I mostly just worry about making sure that you get it turned in sometime before the end of the term so you don't get a zero on it. All right, good question. Anybody else, any other chemical reaction or exo-endothermic reaction style question? <laughs> 